awesome to hear. Um, so I've been in San Francisco for a little while now. I have to say this city is one of the most beautiful I've ever been to. I've actually been here before, but it was only on this trip that I found myself getting buffeted by hurricane force winds while standing on the outside of a cable car. <laughs> if there's anything to make you fall in love with the city, it is almost dying in it. <laughs> and I hope that you all have had a wonderful experience here as well. West Coast, Best Coast. <laughs> Tufts University, because Tufts 
made a lot of headlines when it unrolled this process of asking people to submit an optional part of their application, which was filming a YouTube video. Some people dismissed it, saying, well, Tufts, you're just looking at something really unimportant. What can anyone say in a YouTube video that they're already saying in the transcript and their essays? But I actually thought it was a great thing because when we apply for a job, when we apply for a school, or when we apply for just about anything, we aren't applying as a series of numbers. And we aren't applying as whatever we can manage to fit into a limited essay. We should also apply as who we are. And that's what you can convey a little easier, I think, at least for my generation, in a short YouTube video. So this hip, vibrant culture that my valley has is very self-perpetuating. It's hip and vibrant because it recruits young people who are also hip and vibrant. Other 20-somethings see this office with its Silicon Valley-esque sleekness and design and its cheeky decoration. There's a Wonder Woman statue in a corner. I see a picture by it. I felt insecure about my height. <laughs> <laughs> then there are R2-D2 trash cans everywhere. It's these little details that I noticed that made me think, wow, this is a place that is so much cooler than most of the other companies I've been to. That there are engaged employees. There's the culture that lets you take off your shoes. It's something that people like me see, and it makes us think, hmm, I can see myself working here. Not only are candidates encouraged to be creative and unique, but my body also practices what it preaches. Um, on one of their recruiting sites, is this the world's most awesome doll, or world's most awesome doll.com. Then they use, again, really simple design. And they use words that appeal to me or my generation. And here's one of their synopses. Without a blender, throw in epic dreams, leading edge technology, and quirky work culture, and grind them into a gooey, delicious pulp. What will be this mind about? One of the world's biggest and weirdest online publishing companies in the personal growth industry. We're a close knit team of 100 plus individuals from 32 plus countries with one big goal to touch a billion lives through innovation and education. Compare that to the way any traditional corporation, and I looked up a ton of companies, I swear I'm not picking on Johnson Johnson or Microsoft or G, but if you go to one of those corporations' websites, you're not going to see words like bleeding edge, you're not going to see words like gooey or epic or weird. Epic, bleeding edge, quirky, gooey, delicious, weird. Tell me the last time you saw those in a recruiting letter or on a company website and not in an advertisement for a cupcake. <laughs> Most of the gooey part. As we enter college, graduate, and begin looking for jobs, my peers and I want to be part of projects, companies, and cultures that we're excited about. Cultures like my valleys or many others. And when we are able to get that from status quo opportunities, the existing products, businesses, or approaches, we strike out on our own, we create what we want instead of coming into pre-existing workplaces and affecting change there over time. We are impatient and visionary. We feel ready to make a mark. And this impatience, this vision, this readiness are all assets to any company if you are willing to make room to listen and to believe. If you want to shift this disruptive mindset of one of the most interconnected generations in history into your workplace, then you have to work more like an organism and less like an organization. I say this probably because I came straight out of the AP bio, but you have to be a living, changing, breathing, responsive place. You have to show this in everything you are and everything that you do, so that those that join you aren't there to work their way up through a system, but, or through a structure, but immediately be part of a living system. So my cousin is a recent college grad, and I actually stayed with her for a night when I first arrived in San Francisco and had the chance to talk to her about her life. She just started work um, in technology, and she found a sizable gap between what the company she works for promoted as her job versus what she's doing day to day. And she's more than an archetype for this generation because of her intelligence or her efficiency or her age. She's an archetype because of her impatience, because of her intolerance. Intolerance for doing tedious work without a payoff that she can see. What keeps her doing this job or any job that she's done really, whether the good internships that she got over the summer or the work she did throughout college, was her opportunity to learn. And it's the opportunity to learn that she's seeing slipping away. Hence, it's key for companies to provide ample learning opportunities for young people to keep them around. And I think that honestly, this is something that could be true of many generations. We should never lose that desire to learn throughout our lives, and companies 
schools, uh, whatever organization it is, should recognize that. So in the case of Mind Valley, they really understand that perfectly. They do everything from giving employees time to travel to giving them vouchers so they can buy books on Amazon to learn about whatever topic they want. Now what happens when the younger generation doesn't have a voice? What happens when you feel constrained by the existing structures in companies that work more like traditional organizations than as living, breathing organisms? Over time, you get apathy. And that word has been thrown around a lot when it comes to youth, but I would argue that apathy is no more innate to us than action is somehow innate to others. Apathy in youth comes from losing sight of our own potential and possibility. And with that losing sight of our own potential and possibility comes losing sight of a company's potential and possibility. There's an off-study phenomenon called learned helplessness. I learned about it in my psychology class, and some of you might have heard of it. Our understanding of learned helplessness started in 1967, when a researcher named Mark Seligman took a group of dogs to do research on them as test subjects at UPenn. And he found that the dogs could get trapped in a self-discouraging mindset. If they tried a task long enough with no success, they would simply stop. And even after the situation changed and it became very clear that they could escape if they wanted to, they didn't. If you've ever heard the folk tale about the bear who's in a cage or who's um, trapped with a chain from when it's very little and goes big and doesn't escape, depressing, same story, same phenomenon. Young people aren't bad animals, thank goodness, but from day one, we're used to an adverse stimuli of sorts. We're used to hearing no. We say that we want to do something grand, do something crazy, do something to change the world, and what do we hear? You're too young. Wait until you're older. We go to the theme park and want to ride that really cool ride, and what are we too short? <laughs> Still too short. Okay, that's more of a personal uh, bug of the But over time, we hear you're not smart enough, you're not old enough, you're not tall enough, whatever it may be, and we get very used to hearing no. No, no, we aren't going to listen to you, we aren't going to help you, we aren't going to work with you. And over time, just as repeated failed attempts to scourge those dogs in the learned helplessness study, we fall into a disempowered mindset in which trying is no longer considered useful. Not considering our potential roles in solving any of the problems that plague us or in the organizations we work for is teaching us helplessness. A first step to change that is to include us as authors in meaningful forums, whether public ones or the private ones that shape and define your company. I feel tremendously lucky to speak here on this stage for that reason, because I know that no speaker as young as me has ever done this before, and I feel like that is more a reflection on the awesomeness of this organization than it is about me being special. Because there are so many young people, whether they're teenagers like me who have graduated college, or young people working in your organizations, who could be capable. And you just have to ask if you're courageous enough and if the people around you are courageous enough to take that big leap and find potential employees uh, who might be very young, who might be entry level to be the next keynoters at the company meeting. So again, to skip back in time a little bit because time travel is one of my favorite pursuits when I'm not finishing schoolwork. Back in 2010, when I spoke at the TED conference, I was just a short little 12 year old Okay, clearly one of those things hasn't changed. <laughs> I'll stop with those short jokes now. I'm just like internalized them from all my classmates. <laughs> Learn helplessness right there. I'm a little gross off. <laughs> so I come home and I want to empower other young people because I felt like it wasn't fair that just I should have a venue for ideas worth spreading. This was something that many other kids could benefit from too. And I really credit our sponsors that first year for supporting a 12-year-old kid with an ambitious idea to create a marketplace of ideas for her peers. Because come on, if someone ran up to you and was like, can I use your company's conference center for one day of inspiration and learning, and just by the way, the caveat is that there will be 12 year old kids running around and running the show, <laughs> that might have not sounded like the most appealing thing. But Microsoft handed over their bringing corporate conference center, financial resources and outreach tools to this handful of kids running a conference with the theme of power to the students. So it was pretty apt. And after a successful first year, that conference that organized TEDx Redmond, it continued. It grew every year. And I'll actually um, show you the website really quickly because it's been a huge part of my life basically since I was that uh, young freshman. Here we have 2013 event. 
And if you remember here, one of our years we actually had 1,000 people, and that was from the beginning when we had 700. So we've had some incredibly fun times. And one of the great things is that I really try to make myself replaceable as its leader so that there will be continually a leadership team of high school students, and so my friends, I'm confident we continue in this. What I learned from TEDx Redmond, organizing in 2010, 11, 12, and 2013, was that there was a tremendous demand for ideas worth spreading from my peers. And this idea of gaining inspiration from others, of listening to talks for an entire day, it wasn't one that was just limited to adults. The young people had a tremendous capacity to carry on an event like this. And that there was also tremendous demand from their parents, from teachers, from civic leaders who I saw sitting in the audience, there was demand from them for the authentic stories of young people. And that inspired me almost even more than all the young people sitting in the audience because I realized that it wasn't just us helping our own peers, but also us uh, helping our parents and our elders. So a world where the uninhibited potentiality of young people is leveraged is one where we are asked how we can help you. Sometimes that means bringing in our viewpoints to force organizational change. Or it might mean using our skills to further shared goals. Youth have increasing power in new settings by using the tools that we have at our disposal. All of this Facebook likes and shares might paint a picture of us as slacktivists who do little more than attempt to change the world from our couches, but it's not true. Online social movements can be responsible for massive social change, as anyone who watches the news can tell you. Uh, change in ways as concrete as toppling regimes, or as intangible yet crucial as attitude shifts. So when it comes to diversity and inclusion, creating more opportunities for young people at work is about more than doing the right thing. It's doing the smart thing. Let's start with technology, the smartest thing of all. Like, smartphones, that's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> My mom was like, improvise some jokes. <laughs> technology, and apparently not make jokes very effectively, <laughs> is um, one that allows us to be solutions as opposed to problems. And this sounds really crude, but it's going to be a main point in my speech. We want you to use us. To give you a story, my dad works at a small education nonprofit called Generation Yes, and they have a huge focus on empowering young people through technology. Because they really enjoy practicing what they preach, they actually hire a lot of kids straight out of high school or even still in high school. So one of my dad's co-workers is actually a few decades younger than him. His name is uh, Brennan. And he's a really smart kid. So if his productivity probably equals like two average people. Honestly, he's able to get more work done sometimes maybe on a day than my dad. My dad's the program manager. So my dad actually fixes his schedule around Brennan's. Brennan goes to school full time, so that can be a little bit tricky, but it makes sense. And Generation Yes is an organization that, because of how much it works with students, is really open to that, is open to the idea that young people can be in positions of power, that young people can be extraordinarily productive, and that a senior superior might actually mold their schedule around the same persons because their output is so awesome. And I know that some other young employees who are equally productive, who are equally inspired and talented, might not get such an opportunity where they work, mostly because of their age. And a huge issue is that highly qualified people are getting stuck in entry-level jobs instead of working where they could have the most impact. Envision for a moment young people work. And what do you see? When I first thought that, I will admit that even though I have so many friends with the people who speak at TEDx Redmond and people like Brennan um, who are in crazy, incredible jobs, I thought of a teenager flipping burgers at McDonald's. Because that is the image that we, as a culture, usually think of when we imagine teenagers or 20-somethings working. Um, we associate youth with entry level automatically. But this ignores the capability of so many people in my generation to handle complex tasks. In today's environment, many entrepreneurs' success stories have arisen straight out of the experience. Think about Richard Branson and Virgin, or Airbnb. Um, Airbnb is an online travel site, Santa Air, Bed and Breakfast. It's sort of like a Craigslist for rentals. Anyone can list their spare room on Airbnb, and you can also find them in other cities. It's wildly popular, it's a multi-million dollar business, but the founders of Airbnb are kids, straight out of college, who moved to a certain city by the bay, 
and they attended an industrial design conference where they realized that there was a small problem. The hotel market was saturated. Attendees were having difficulty finding any rooms. Those of you who have been to South by Southwest and did not book your hotel rooms early enough might know that feeling. And they realized that they couldn't make rent on their apartment at the same time. So, as any young, broke college grad to do, they decided to come start up. Nothing to lose, after all. <laughs> and this Airbnb was born. Going from straight out of college to a CEO seems like a story you'll never see except in novels or TV shows, but it should provide a lesson because it's a story that's been played out so many times, right here in San Francisco and around the world, thanks to technology. More and more organizations are achieving incredible things when they realize how they can use young people, especially young people who are gifted with technology. The organization Code for America matches teenagers and young adults with programming skills to local governments. So Code for America projects have started apps that have come into great use during snowstorms when people need to report utilities are out. It's been used for all kinds of different things um, in places from Hawaii to New York. It allows local governments to more effectively reach out to citizenry. And we all know that government's budgets are strapped, and so Code for America is providing a really great, basically free way for this to happen. Another project, 17-year-old Jason Patel's NGO Technologies, creates solutions for nonprofits. He actually implemented a biogas energy project, built information tech infrastructure for an organization supporting Indian cloth weavers. He developed a website for a nonprofit fighting human rights abuses, and more. It's a long list. Think about how many teenagers like Jaisal, he's still in high school, so the same grade as me. Think about how many teenagers like Jaisal might be sitting in high school classrooms or in college classrooms right now, just waiting for the chance to serve. When the right people are encouraged to do things they're knowledgeable about, instead of the jobs that we think they're ready for or old enough for, it spells success. A breakthrough means increased opportunities for us to make our voices heard, whether on stages like these, in the mass media, or through grassroots organization. A breakthrough equals young people helping each other help themselves. With events like TEDx Redmond that show, isn't this our elders who care about these words spreading? And a breakthrough means established organizations or leaders asking us for help instead of always expecting that it'll be the other way around. This is what it takes to get rid of a generation's learned helplessness. It's what it takes to make organizational change happen as well. So the question is, do you want your organization to be that living, breathing organism? Do you want it to be responsive, to grow, to meet the needs and desires of a new generation? If you want to position yourself for the future, then you need the future on your team. As our workforce becomes more diverse in all the facets of that term, whether it's culturally or generationally, for the first time we have many, many generations working side by side, which creates such an interesting culture, I think, in many places. I've always enjoyed learning from veterans in the field. One of my favorite things to do whenever I'm at an education conference is speak to teachers who have been in the classroom for 25, 30, even 40 years, because I can learn so much from them how education has changed over the years, students they've had, war stories. There's so much. Seniority is important because it brings with it experience, knowledge, and connections. But what I found is that a status quo hierarchy that rewards seniority more than merit, and this whole issue has been seen in education very dramatically as well as other things, that it traps young people, talented young people like Jaisal, in low-level positions. When I talk about young people and loss of opportunities, I often quote one of my favorite poems. Uh, Langston Hughes wrote Harlem, obviously about a completely different matter, but I love the line about the dream deferred. Um, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? In the case of young people seeking opportunity, that explosion is manifested in some incredible disruptions of existing systems. If we take the issue of where people go in life when, Many young people are asking, who says I need to work on someone's arbitrary schedule and getting things done in life? Going to college at 15 might seem very peculiar, but not to Rotom Gardas. He went to UC Berkeley when he was 15. Actually got through college, I think he was majoring in biochem, minored in creative writing, 
started his own DECAL uh, Democratic Education at Cal. It's a uh, student-led courses in chemistry. He started a chemistry journal for undergrads, wrote poetry, published a book of poetry, somehow managed to live it up, and graduated in three years. So, you have an 18-year-old, he's now going to Oxford to study, he comes back to the Bay Area pretty frequently, and he had to start at this time, he also sold for a lot of money, I believe. So, I think about where I was at 15, I just turned 16, by the way, so, I was like, yeah, I should um, probably do something with my life. <laughs> um, and then, at TEDx Redmond, seriously, this is like, it's, it's a contest to see who can make the other person feeling more of an underachiever because Taylor Wilson is this nuclear physicist. He's uh, 18 now, I believe, but he was 17 when he came to speak. And when he was 14, the age I was when I met him, uh, he had already built a nuclear reactor in his house. The um, US government got slightly suspicious and like, wanted to know what was going on. He ended up doing some research at the University of Nevada. It was crazy stuff. So I was like, dude, you made me feel really, really unaccomplished. This is not <laughs> But to the point um, of not working on someone else's schedule. So actually, Taylor Wilson is a perfect example, along with Tom Carter Doss, who says that you can't build a nuclear reactor in 14 unless it's illegal, which it most likely But <laughs> Aside from those pesky little issues, who says you can't go to college when you're 15? Who says you can't start a startup or make an award-winning app? Robert Nay was 12 years old when he made Bubble Ball. It's a best-selling app. Um, on the app store. To tell people like Robert or Taylor or Tom Carr that they're doing well for their age would quite frankly be an insult because they're doing pretty well compared to just about anyone I can think of. They're doing well, period. So I'm seeing a lot of this subversion of traditional systems simply by working outside, by working on your own time frame. And then there are folks who like to actually challenge the system. Raise your hands if you've heard of the Teal Fellowship. Okay, I'm seeing a couple raised hands. So the Teal Fellowship is a two-year, $100,000 grant, and it was set up by an entrepreneur named Peter Teal. He founded PayPal. Raise hands for no PayPal. Okay, yep, that's, that's a lot more name recognition. So Peter Teal had a lot of money and decided to use some of it to encourage this generation's best and brightest to bypass college, at least for a little bit, and go straight to work on developing their passions. So 20 fellows are selected every year, and an extremely competitive application process that includes detailed proposals, telephone interviews, and this cutthroat competition in San Francisco for 40 finalists to get narrowed down, in which they have to present their ideas in a super high-speed competition, and it's in the heart of Silicon Valley. So I actually entered the Teal Fellowship competition last year, and it was a great experience for me because I'd never been around so many people who knew exactly what they wanted to do. It was an inspiring process for me. I got to be a semi-finalist, and I think that everybody who got the fellowship last year deserved it so richly. Um, one person who's a Teal Fellow, actually, not here, I've had, but Madison Maxey is someone who has been doing a lot of work. She had to work very hard in order to convince her parents to let her drop out of college. And it's hard to tell your parents, I want to drop out of college so I can build a better blazer. But I'm guessing that her conversation was something along those lines. And she funded it on Kickstarter. She actually raised a little bit over her goal. The title of her product in the URL is Building a Brand in 365 Days. So you're seeing kind of an intersection of that, not only working on your own time frame, but also technology and um, going outside the traditional system. So she's incredibly cool. And you can see she's a young entrepreneur with a passion for garment design. She finds herself working with pages of nylon and in town healthier. He's lived in France and has developed a cultural clash aesthetic that makes her designs both interesting and sophisticated. So she's very much uh, on social media, and I think that has helped her a lot in promoting her project. And so another Teal Fellow is Dale Stevens. He applied for the Teal Fellowship in its inaugural year back in 2010 and he won. His project was a movement called Uncollege. Basically what it sounds like. It does not make any excuses for what it's basically doing. The quote here is, you wasted $150,000 $150, on an education. You could have gone for a buck fifty in late charges in the public library. <laughs> I would correct Will Hunting and say that $35 in late charges is more likely, but maybe that's just because I am terrible at returning books. 
<laughs> yeah, I have to use a waiver on that. <laughs> so, what Hill College is doing is basically something like the Teal Fellowship. It's very much incentivizing not going to college. By having a gap year, that teaches people how to do a startup, how to pursue a project, and it says how to learn better. His message is <laughs> a very different one than the one that my sister and I heard when we were growing up. Um, one that I heard from my parents growing up, I should say, because it was an expectation, or like an assumption that we would go to college. It was an assumption because it was an assumption that we wanted to be successful. It was an assumption that we wanted a good place in society. And it was an assumption of my parents and of everyone else's that college was the first prerequisite. Increasingly, though, young people like me may be hearing a different message, whether because of things like the Teal Fellowship, or things like Dale Stevens on college, or people like Maddie Maxey, who are dropping out of college and becoming very successful as Teal Fellows and in doing their own startups. And we're also hearing a message from some mainstream companies increasingly. I have a friend, Mohammed Adi, who came to the TEDx earlier this year. He brought on a robot on stage. And unknown to most of the people in the audience, a few days later, he was going to be flying out to interview with Google for a job. He had not yet graduated high school. But this kid, because he had created apps that were making hundreds of thousands of dollars and was an engineer for Android phones, he had already gotten this very important interview without a piece of paper that said he graduated college or high school. To me, that's actually representative of something very good. Because it is crucial to recruit and welcome young people like Dale and Muhammad. They have diverse education backgrounds. They may not have that fancy piece of paper with beautiful script with their name and a degree, but if you want the best of my generation, then look beyond a degree. Look beyond credentials. Put more attention on our hobbies, our projects, our pastimes, because they may just be things like that. They may just be things like building a brand in 365 days. They may just be things like traveling the world and giving talks and going to conferences, debating education issues at TED, writing books, starting movements, turning a profit on software that we made in our spare time. I can guarantee you that what I have learned from traveling, from going to these conferences, from meeting people in an audience like you guys with so much energy and so much wisdom is greater than I've learned in many, many hours of sitting in a classroom chair. And I say this is someone who loves school. I think that because of people like Madison Maxey, Dale Stevens, or Tom Carr, all these others who are finding success outside conventional systems, conventional systems should take note. One of my favorite articles is one that I read just recently. It's called Why Elites Fail. It's in the nation. I highly recommend it. Um, and it, there's this one line that particularly stood out, is it makes me feel the urgency of conventional systems taking note. In Liquidated, an ethnography of Wall Street, anthropologist Karen Ho shows how the obsession with smartness produces a meritocratic feedback loop in which bankers' growing influence itself becomes further evidence that they are, in fact, the smartest. According to one Morgan Stanley analyst Ho interviewed, those being recruited by the firm are typically told they will be working with the brightest people in the world. These are the greatest minds of the century. Uh, Robert Hopkins, the Vice President of Mergers and Acquisitions at Lehman Brothers, plus here of those who inhabit Wall Street. We are talking about the smartest people in the world. We are. They are the smartest people in the world. And, oh. So we have going on there is people being told they are the smartest, joining minds that are the smartest, and you get a bubble. I don't think that this feedback loop is limited to meritocracy and smartness, and I don't think that it's a problem that's limited to Wall Street. It's something that happens whenever you get a group of people who are in one mindset, and that mindset is self-perpetuating. It happens within any system without devil's advocates, without people with new ideas, without impertinent questions. So people who aren't entrenched in the existing system, people who will disagree, are absolutely crucial. The thing is that these people who will disagree, who will ask impertinent questions, are not people you will find in traditional recruiting techniques. They may not be people who have gone to the same reliable theater colleges. They may not be the people that will um, make you feel comfortable in an interview. They may be people who have done things like gap year or who have started their own companies, etc. So, is anyone here a Downton Abbey fan? Oh, yes! I've seen some raised hands. Okay, so don't spoil anything for me because I haven't actually gotten caught up with stuff. But, um, People die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I actually mentioned Downton Abbey not because I just wanted to know, 
But because, it, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, sorry, in episode, uh, sorry, season four, you know, there's this generational, or the previous season, there's this generational tradition between Matthew Crawley and his father, my Lord Grantham, about how to manage the estate. And you have a young God who's going to, like, change everything, and you have an old guy who's saying, no, hold up, like, I want to do things the way that they've been done by my ancestors, because this is England, and that's how we do things. And in a very, very reductive way of cramming many, many episodes of my favorite show into that summary, I rather like it as a metaphor, because it shows what can happen, what good can happen, with people who will question things and make you a little bit uncomfortable coming to your organization. By 2020, millennials will be 46% of the workforce. That's according to the graphic I found on Forbes, so hopefully it's correct. I've read lots of articles, as you can tell, and these graphics on Forbes, and watched videos with titles like, Why We Hate Millennials, Things on Time, Things on Forbes, etc. Uh, bad writing, insulin attitudes, informal dressing. I apologize for the sneakers. I, I was really feeling the walking. It, I would vehemently argue for a different approach. I hope that you didn't judge me too much because of the sneakers. And I hope that my peers who are walking into the office will be judged so much based on what they're wearing or how they're speaking or what they're listening to, but really what they have to say. An approach with Wonder Woman statues and R2-D2 trash cans. Offices that let you take your shoes off or kick back in a beanie bag or a tree house. Companies that hire not based on where you went to school, but what you've done with your life and what you will do. This is the kind of approach that I hope to see when I apply for a job. Young people aren't just young people. We're people with electric minds and beating hearts that we're just waiting to use for epic, bleeding edge, gooey, weird things we can go crazy about. So I want you to take a moment to talk to the person next to you about answering the question, does your organization fit the bill? Is it bleeding edge, gooey, weird, and epic? Talk to your neighbor next to you. Jake on stage, you know that it's the Ed Light from the end of my rope. Um, it's my dancing skills are not there. I do want to spaz about one, but three homecoming dances so far. So. So, could I hear some of this dialogue? Because it sounded like you guys had a great time. It was very amazing. And I said many things while you were talking. But, um, shall we lost to all turn which is a good thing. So, um, this one? Anything to share? This one, right here. Oh, we need a mic. Here it comes. Hi, I'm Jake. Hi, thanks, and James Wright. It's funny that we were having this conversation at the lunch period around, you know, our companies aren't ready, and they should have been ready 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how the companies need to fast track, because I think there's been a perception that we can make you a baby boomer. And I think what you've uncovered <laughs> is that you're not going to look at us you got to just create your own thing, just like baby boomers did for what we currently have. And we talked about at lunch the dress code, for example, and how, you know, even the interviewing techniques and the unconscious bias and all the stuff that goes on along with that. And what I think that we came to the conclusion that we even talked about just now, which is this is a new conversation, but I don't think anyone understands how fast we need to move to really make a difference, to get your generation, which is 80 plus million of you, to really come into the workforce and really make a difference. And I don't think that while we've uncovered all of these problems, I don't know if we have a solution yet. Because we've talked about, we know what we're supposed to do, but we have a lot of managers and a lot of directors and a lot of VPs who are like, no, they're going to become a baby boomer. And we're like, no, they're not. <laughs> you're being our professionals, we know you're not. So I think that's the thing that I only you know I want to say, but I'm so glad that Sherm allowed you to come speak because all of us, I think all of us in this work have been saying this for so many years, and it's so frustrating that we still work with organizations who don't understand they won't have an organization for us to work in if they don't change and realize their competition isn't the person in their direct uh, uh, business, it's Google, it's Apple, it's Facebook, who have already built that infrastructure to let, let you just be you. Mm -hmm. Great work, Seth. Hi, yes, I'm, my name is Angela, and I'm a 
company called One Page, and I do agree with everything that the gentleman said before me. Um, and I think it's amazing that you brought this up, and again, that Sherm um, allowed you to speak. So with One Page, what we've done is gamify the whole hiring process, and basically have taken the process that you've mentioned and allow people to pitch their value to the company and allow to talk about what makes them unique in their background as to why they're the best fit, what makes the company money, how it'll save the company money, everything that you're talking about, how it doesn't matter where you come from in your past, it doesn't matter about your age, whether or not um, you've had the education, and especially you know growing up here in the Bay Area as you have, and understanding that um, the startup culture is a place of innovation, and that's why there are so many large corporations all over the world who've brought innovation centers into Silicon Valley to do exactly what you're doing right now, and I definitely applaud you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what I'm definitely sensing is that, yeah, there's this attitude, as you mentioned, of trying to turn many in my generation into baby boomers, and where I think of artists have gotten really, really good as of late, I do think that there needs to be an approach that realizes how we can contribute as who we are. And I have definitely seen that coming more from a lot of the tech companies here in Silicon Valley than in some of the more traditional companies, places like where my cousin works or um, more out on the East Coast. And uh, I think that there are three things that I would recommend any company, regardless of where you think you stand as far as that bleeding edge, gooey and weird, uh, that part goes, there are a few things you can do. One is to update the culture. Updating the culture is difficult. It's probably one of the hardest out of these three to do because it requires changing so many things from the way that people walk into work and the way that they address different issues and even the way that um, they might dress or act um, within the workplace. But I think that it is possible to make it weird, gooey, and playful. Just try something as simple as rolling out a few beanie bags. And you will have changed something small in the way that people look at that corner um, in the kitchen or wherever it might be. So they realize that work isn't necessarily the place where you have to go and completely sit back and stand up straight all the time, that there is that possibility to relax and that many great ideas can actually come to you that way. It's not just the younger set that will benefit from that. The second thing would be to advertise for jobs in a voice that speaks to the fact that you have regard for our uniqueness. When you interview, look at the way that we spend our lives more heavily than the credentials or the degrees that we have. Because the former, how we spend our lives, will be far more indicative of our passions, commitment, and ability to affect change. School is, for the most part, what we have to do, but it's what we do with our lives that shows what we want to do, what we are committed to doing, and what we will continue to do. And the third thing is emphasizing that seniority should not exist at the expense of hearing and responding to the voices of younger employees. That seniority isn't a system that says, this is who I listen to and this is who I don't, but rather one that respects what kind of different things many different people within your organization have to offer. Expand your form. Ask young people to keynote at your next company meeting. Make changes because of what they say. If you are going to hire fresh minds, then let, the, what, let what we are change you, and let what we bring change you. All this is for a future where young people like me can embrace not learned helplessness, but learned empowerment, learned potency, learned value. When we can take the vision we have into your work environment, we will take your purpose into the future with the strongest footing possible. I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have, but I really appreciate your attention. We have one more over here. Oh. Hi, I work in higher education, and one of the things that amazes me is how our faculty are resisting and pushing back quite a bit on adopting new technology to teach and with the rise of cost of higher education and how that's affecting your generation. Uh, technology seems to have a, a, a role in, do, in helping to reduce those costs. So, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, actually I read a really good um, article recently about the um, new massive online open courses like the that And I've actually done a few of those like open course courses on my and a bunch of others because 
quite honestly, it's hard to find the class talk about this literature in high school. And so I think that, um, yeah, professors should definitely be open to the fact that that brings so many possibilities. And uh, well, I visited Berkeley actually over the weekend, and I had the chance to attend some fairly large lectures. I realized that what was coolest about those, um, so I went to like a um, chemistry one, and there was a demonstration where, to put it succinctly, stuff blew up. I realized that that was at the being able to smell the smoke, but the rest of it talked about enthalpies and saying, look at this, and here are a few places. That was stuff that could have been done online. And that was stuff that someone who was really good at chemistry probably could have gone through faster and fallen asleep less through. I saw some people nodding off like large lecture halls and everything. Um, so there's a tremendous potential just that I saw like uh, while I was there to use. Whether it's massive online open courseware or um, just a professor posting more stuff online. And um, there's also Cam Academy and more high school classrooms are doing flipping the classroom. So they are having students do what's homework traditionally in class and then watching videos, which would be the lecture in class traditionally as homework. So to put it shortly, yes, I'm a huge fan of online learning because I feel that the best part about school for me has always been the stuff that is not necessarily the lecture, not necessarily the, the stuff that I could get from um, you know, something online, but rather the teacher talking to me, and there's rarely enough time for that because of the information delivery. So yeah, thank you so much for that question. So, um, Top of Hi, Dora. Thank you so much for that talk. It was really inspirational. And my name is Seth, and I work with an advertising company in LA. So we do have a really epic culture, and that's not necessarily the issue. I don't know that there is an issue, but I do have a curiosity about millennial leaders. And are you guys talking about how race and class, um, socioeconomic class and ethnicity intersect with this generation? I can think of like lots of um, lots of youth who are young, but maybe they're working class, and so maybe for them, you know, that job at a manufacturing company is where they want to be, and not necessarily a tech startup firm. So, what are those conversations like? That's a good question, and I would say that um, I don't think at least uh, many people I know, like the leaders of tech firm, I don't think we're talking about that enough. And I've seen um, that a lot of my friends don't quite realize the importance of diversity because they haven't necessarily encountered it and seen how it can change mindsets and seen how it can uh, provide them with a wider lens on the world, I guess. Because I live in sort of a suburb of Seattle and it's, um, it's a different way, I guess, of um, looking at diversity than if I were to live like directly in the city or in somewhere like San Francisco. Um, so I would say that my age group needs to address that more and we also need to realize that, um, yeah, that, that socioeconomic uh, racial differences, that those provide, um, that we can look at those differences for opportunity, I think. Um, so as far as opportunities outside of the tech world, yeah, I completely agree. And I would have loved to highlight some stories that weren't necessarily so Silicon Valley specific. I guess it was more because this is the area I'm presenting um, that I would have those characteristics of weird and gooey and <laughs> I don't think so. So, but Dora, we appreciate you for your perspectives and for challenging us because we do know that that is work that we have to do. Adora is going to be in the Sherm store in just a few minutes to sign copies of her books. You can see them flying fingers. And then one is a children's um, book, so if you are a parent, these are great books for them to have as well. She's going to be signing immediately after today's um, session. So please make sure that you stop by. And I also, again, want you to join me in thanking EMC again for sponsoring today's session. We'll see you back tomorrow morning. Have a wonderful evening and enjoy.